All right, guys, today's video is going to be on animal bites. People say you'd be like a In today's video, we're going to cover three major topics. That's going to be our tetanus, rabies, skin infections like cellulitis and erysipelas, as well as osteomyelitis, just to finish things off. All right, so let's start off with tetanus. This gram-positive anaerobe causes muscle spasms by inhibiting GABA release at the synapse. So lockjaw disease or tetanus. Let's go through diagnosis, prevention, post-exposure prophylaxis, and treatment. So for diagnosis, this disease is going to present with muscle spasms, and there's three characteristics ones you should know. There's going to be rhesus sardonicus, which is just a grimacing face. It kind of looks like the joker. Then there's going to be opisthoclonus, which is an arching of the back, and the posterior back muscles are being hyperflexed, so you're extending the back. And then you have um, trismus, which is also known as locked jaw. For this diagnosis, it's pretty much clinical. You can also do a wound culture and serology, which are a little bit less sensitive, so just watch out for that. Now, in terms of prevention, vaccination is the main way to go here. There's five doses given before the age of 11, and then at 11 years old, you switch over to Tdap from DTAP, and then you continue vaccination every 10 years. Also, make sure you give a vaccine at 27 weeks of pregnancy to uh, mothers expecting to deliver. So the five doses of DTAP that are given are two months, four months, six months, one year, and four year in children. Now watch out for this vaccination timeline. You should know it because in some questions I've seen about this topic, you are given the child's age and they say that they're up to date on their vaccines and you should know uh, how many they've received so far. So watch out for that. And really, the questions are going to be on post-exposure tetanus prophylaxis. So you have someone who's gotten a scratch or stepped on a nail or gotten an animal bite in this case, and you need to prophylax them for tetanus. Now, important numbers here to know are 3, 5, and 10. So here, 10 and 5, okay? If you know these three numbers, you should be good to go on learning this little chart. So... When do you need to do nothing? So these situations are when the person's been fully vaccinated, three or more vaccines, okay? And if they've had a vaccine within the past 10 years and the wound is pretty minor or clean, then you do nothing. So three and 10, nothing. Three and five if the wound is deep. So if they've had their vaccinations within the past five years and they have a little bit of a deeper, dirtier wound, then you also do nothing, all right? Now, let's go through the next scenario. When do you give the vaccine? Well, if they've exceeded the 10-year limit on their clean wound and they're fully vaccinated, then you just give a Tdap or TD. If they've exceeded their vaccine limit of five years and they're fully vaccinated with a deep wound, then you give the vaccine. And actually, in most cases, you'll be giving the vaccine, so just watch out for that. Most people don't know when they've been vaccinated, so that's where we come here, to the unknown or less than three total vaccines. In that case, you're going to give the vaccine to all minor wounds, okay, because you don't know. You're just going to assume it's been more than 10 years. Uh, and then you're going to give the vaccine and uh, human tetanus immunoglobulin to people with deeper wounds, so unknown or less than three vaccines, HTIG. That's the only case when you give the immunoglobulin. Everyone else, it's pretty simple, vaccine. You just need to watch out when you do nothing versus when you vaccinate. You can only do nothing if the person's received three or more vaccines. All right, so treatment. If you do have tetanus, now you've been diagnosed, you have a positive culture, serology, you have the symptoms, the main antibiotic used here is metronidazole. In these people, you're also going to give the vaccine and the immunoglobulin at a different site from the vaccine. Because if you give the immunoglobulin, it's going to bind your vaccine and make it ineffective. So make sure you vaccinate them and give them the Ig in the other arm so that they don't interact. Next up, we have rabies, the bullet-shaped, single-stranded RNA rhabdovirus. All right, so what do you need to know about rabies? You need to know that the prognosis is very bad, so much so that one of the diagnostic methods is post-mortem hippocampal and cerebellar biopsy, where you see these classic negri bodies. So the importance here is to really do post-exposure prophylaxis if you suspect rabies, and we'll be running through the algorithm on how to do that. So diagnosis of rabies, it's a virus, so you can take a sample through serum, saliva, CSF, or skin, 
and then do RT-PCR on it. You can also cell culture it for a viral sample and do an antibody test. So to prevent rabies, there's really only one way, which is vaccination. But most people don't get the rabies vaccine routinely. It's mainly reserved for people in animal control or traveling to places that have no or limited post-exposure prophylaxis. So now what happens when you get bit? So animals that are not caught or not able to be observed, the person has to receive post-exposure prophylaxis. Now, only carnivores usually carry rabies. So there's wild carnivores and domestic ones. And the difference is in a wild carnivore, if you're able to catch it, you euthanize it and then take a brain sample to test it for rabies to confirm the diagnosis. And in domestic carnivores, you observe the animal for 10 days. The incubation period for rabies is two to 14 days and the animal will usually present with symptoms within five days. So those are the diagnostic methods if you are able to capture the animal. No post-exposure prophylaxis is required for herbivores or for vaccinated animals. Now, what is this post-exposure prophylaxis? It's the rabies immunoglobulin and also vaccination at zero and three days. All right, and if the person is vaccinated, you do not need to give the immunoglobulin, you just give the vaccine. But these cases of vaccinated people are so rare that this is the routine uh, for most people. And treatment for rabies, really there's no treatment when you once you become symptomatic, it's down to palliative care from there. Our last topic here that we're going to cover is infections, so cellulitis, erysipela, and osteomyelitis. And here we have a nice little treatment algorithm for superficial skin infections. Now this includes non-purulent infections like cellulitis and erysipela, and purulent ones such as abscess. So it, let's just remember the key difference between cellulitis and erysipelas. Cellulitis is going to have a deeper infection and it's going to have hazier borders. So I'm going to draw it like this. And erysipelas is going to be more superficial and have more clearly demarcated edges. So just remember that for reference. And what you're worried about cellulitis is that the infection could be so deep that it affects the bone and that's called osteomyelitis. Now the main diagnosis for both of these is uh, pretty clinical and you can have CBCs, CMPs, which can reveal risk factors. You can do a superficial skin ultrasound to see the um, size of the infection. And just remember that for osteomyelitis, you're gonna need a CT or an MRI to really diagnose it. But for reference, you'll have very point tenderness at the site of infection. Going back to our algorithm here, if it's a non-purulent infection, so either our cellulitis or our erysipelas, we have mild, moderate, and severe. So we're going to reserve our IV antibiotics and surgical debridement for more severe infections. And then for our purulent infections, so this is our abscess, even for the mild ones, you can do incision and drainage because you really can't get antibiotics into an abscess. That protective coating, uh, the hard shell around it of connective tissue is really stopping you. So incision and drainages for purulent and non-purulent, you can start them on oral antibiotics, only do incision and drainage if necessary. And remember, osteomyelitis can be one of the complications of a deeper infection, a deep puncture wound, a cat bite, a dog bite, um, and a progression from cellulitis in someone who could be potentially immunocompromised. Hope you guys had fun in this review on animal bites and potential infections, and I'll see you in the next video.